Hello, this is Joe Trahan welcoming you to the All Me Podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, whose mission is to enlighten the world to the truths about appearance and performance-enhancing substances. As the national leader on this subject, they communicate their educational messages through various methods, including this podcast. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome back to another episode of the All Me Podcast. This is Don Hooten Jr. and I'm excited to be your host. We have an electrifying guest today who you're going to love hearing from. In this episode, we're going to talk with Taylor Hooten Foundation's MLB All Me Advisory Board member and Boston Red Sox ace, Chris Sale. When you think of a champion, a leader, and a role model, Chris Sale is one of those guys who comes to mind. Drafted by the Chicago White Sox in 2010, he quickly climbed the ladder to success. Sale has been a dominant pitcher in the big leagues for the past 10 years and has set a number of strikeout records. He's a seven-time All-Star, two-time American League strikeout leader, and has set an MLB record for reaching 2,000 strikeouts in the fewest number of innings and helped the Boston Red Sox win a world championship in 2018. At six feet, six inches tall, Chris weighs in at about 180 pounds. In this episode, Chris is going to share his stories of how he was told to get bigger, stronger, and put on weight throughout his entire life. Regardless, he's living proof that you don't need to be bigger or stronger to dominate in professional sports. And the most important thing is he's done it the right way without the use of appearance and performance enhancing substances. It's important for you to hear why Chris Sale stepped forward voluntarily as a role model for young people and joined our MLB advisory board five years ago. He has taken a strong stance against the use of appearance and performance enhancing substances and gets into detail as to why it's important to him. We want to thank Gatorade for helping us make this All Me podcast episode possible. We're so very thankful for their support. Please be sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. We're so thankful for all of your support and would appreciate any donations to help keep the Taylor Hootens Foundation message going. Let's talk with Chris Sale. It's a real honor to welcome our guest, Chris Sale, to the All Me podcast. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So due to the pandemic, it's been a real challenge for us all. How are you and your family doing? Uh, we're we're holding, holding it down pretty well. You know, we're down here in Florida, so there's a little bit uh, lighter down here. So we've just been kind of going around the neighborhood on bikes, you know, swimming a lot in the pool. The weather has been great. So uh, we've been able to be outside for most of it. So it's been a lot of fun being able to spend this time with my family in a time that I really have never really I've never really had this time down here. I haven't lived in Florida this time of year in a long time, so it's, uh, it's nice. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and trying to have a conversation with you in you know, this time of year here in early March would be nearly impossible because you'd be in the middle of a baseball season. So we really appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today. And you know, I think I speak for everyone that we just can't wait for people to begin to heal so that we can ease back into life and baseball can begin because I know that's something everybody's missing right now, probably including yourself. But the genesis of this All Me podcast is to spread our message and mission to enlighten people to the truths about appearance and performance enhancing substances. And we're doing so by giving our guests a platform to share their stories and inspire others to live and compete without the use of these harmful substances. So I'd like to start by going back to when you were a young man growing up and some of the challenges that you faced that led you down the path of becoming one of the best pitchers in baseball history. Chris, where did you grow up? And let's talk about kind of, you know, you as a young man. Well, I grew up in uh, Lakeland, Florida, which is, you know, I moved down to Fort Myers, went to school, went to college here, and I stayed down here. But I grew up in Lakeland. And I would say, you know, one of the bigger reasons, I, I always loved sports. And I've, I've played many different sports. I only played probably three of them organized, you know, soccer, baseball, and golf. Uh, but I love playing basketball. I love throwing the football in the backyard with my dad. And that was kind of the key to all of it was, you know, I I always had a passion for sports, but it was always fun because, my, you know, my, I got to hang out with my dad. And, we, I mean, the hours that we spent in my parents' backyard throwing a baseball, kicking a soccer ball, throwing a football, shooting hoops, it was uh, – he was he was always there. So that was that – was, uh, that was a huge portion of my childhood that I remember being a kid hanging out with my dad playing these sports. And that's kind of why I fell in love with the game. 
what age did you start playing baseball and kind of once you started playing baseball, when did you figure, man, I'm, I'm, I'm a pitcher. Like I love this position. And, and did you get a chance to play other positions that you might've liked? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I remember playing since T-ball. I mean, I played since I was, you know, I guess five or six years old, whenever that starts, you know, kind of the, the roles, you, I mean, you kind of bounce around, you kind of figuring out what you're good at and uh, where you can play. So I didn't really, really lock into being a pitcher until probably right before. I mean, I always pitched, but I played other positions. Okay. And just like every other pitcher, I thought I could hit way, way <laughs> longer than I actually could. So, uh, you know, I tried to carry that torch as long as possible. Yeah. And, but I would say high school is when I really kind of locked into being, you know, kind of pitcher specific and then college for sure. You know, I, I grew up playing high school ball, went, went on to play, uh, you know, college baseball at a couple of different Division One schools. And I always thought I could hit through high school. I was great. I could hit, bat a little over 300. And I remember doing some showcases as I began getting into the age where you start looking at colleges. And I just remember it was actually when they first built Camden Yards. And we had a showcase there. And they had these two twin brothers, both left-handers, throwing low to mid-90s. And I can't remember their names, but – I remember standing in there the first time, and this dude throws a 94-mile-an-hour fastball. And I heard it. I didn't see it. And I just told the catcher, dude, throw two more of those. I Don't hit me. You know, but I'm out. Like, I, I, that's when I quickly learned. I was like, I am not, I am not a hitter. But, you know, it's, it's, it, I, I just love playing baseball. So, I mean, do you still play golf today? Are you keep it up with any other sports? Oh, yeah. I, golf is one of my favorite things to do, especially in the offseason during spring training. You know, obviously with, you know, my arm now, I haven't been able to play for, for quite a while. But uh, – and I've still got a little ways to go. But I, I, that's one thing I'll never stop playing golf. That, and that's the, that's the beauty about golf is you can play. Yeah. You know, you can have an 80-year-old, a 30-year-old, and a 12-year-old <laughs> playing golf, and you can somehow make a game out of it and make it competitive. And, uh, you know, I've, I've always enjoyed playing that even as a little kid. Yeah, it, it, it's a humbling game, and you are in the freaking heart of where, uh, you know, it's perfect to play golf. Growing up, more than likely, you weren't a huge guy. My, my brother Taylor was six feet, two inches. He was 180, 190 pounds as a junior in high school, and he was told at the time that he needed to get bigger to improve his chances of making the varsity team and if he wanted to go on and play college ball. And for many years, we've always been told at some point in our lives, we need to get bigger, we need to get stronger, we need to get faster. And in some cases, including myself, you know, you need to lose weight. As you were growing up as a kid and going in through high school and even your college years and into, into the professional realm, did anyone ever tell you that you needed to get bigger, you need to get stronger, you need to get faster? Every day of my life up until yesterday. <laughs> okay. I mean, it, 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 it's been a constant, you know, thing. I mean, I was, I've always been really tall and I've always been really skinny. And, you know, you, you don't, you know, obviously being a pitcher or being a basketball yeah. player, you know, that's kind of the two things you could be. You could be a wide receiver, but you got to be fast. But yeah, I mean, my, my entire, my entire life, even through my professional career was you're too skinny. You need to gain weight. You need to bulk up, yada, 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 blah, 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 all that stuff. Yeah. But for me, it wasn't as much of gaining weight as much as it was being strong and being flexible because I clearly, you know, I don't, I don't generate, you know, what I, I don't do what I do because I have big muscles. I do what I do because I, you know, I'm flexible. I, I kind of work, you know, and kind of whippy and, and kind of sling some stuff around. It yeah. looks like sometimes, but I always took it with a grain of salt. Like, okay, I, I probably do need to gain some weight, but more importantly than that, like I just need to take care of what I have. Yeah, because sometimes you see guys bulk up and it ends up hurting them, or you see somebody lose a lot of weight, and it's just you know different different people's bodies work in different ways, and kind of just need to use what you have instead of trying to get what someone else has because it might not work the way that it works for them. I agree. I was told in college I needed to lose weight, and and I probably did. So I went on a quick weight loss type diet thing, and ended up having problems with my elbow as a pitcher, and. And the surgeon believed at that time it's, you know, you changed your body type. I mean, you were so used to one body type for so long, having the same throwing angles and all that sort of stuff that this could have possibly caused the injury. As this young man and being told so many times that you need to get bigger, and I'm sure there's a lot of pressures that go along with that. Did anything in your young life, you know, ever 
help you make that decision to not turn to the use of appearance and performance enhancing substances to earn that goal of getting bigger, stronger, faster, like you were being told? Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely times, especially later on, you know, when I was a kid, I, I, I really didn't know about it. You know, I was naive to, you know, kind of what was going on. I was, you know, when when steroids were running through baseball, I was anywhere between five and, you know, 15 years old. And I was just like, oh, man, these guys are just big guys that hit the ball really far, or throw really fast. Up until I probably got to college, it, I mean, I knew about it in high school, but that, you know, I was, just, I, I guess I was always just scared of it, you know, like. I knew what it could do on the performance side, but I knew even more about what it could do to your body. You know what I mean? Yeah. And as, as fun as it would be to, you know, bulk up 50 pounds, throw five miles an hour harder and, you know, whatever it is, you're basically, you're, you're digging your own grave there, especially with some of the ways that these guys are doing it. You know, it's not meant to do it in a garage or in a, in a back storage closet somewhere. And I don't know. I, I just, I always appreciated, you know, doing things the right way. And my, my, my father was, was a huge advocate against a couple things that I even stand true to this day. You know, not, yeah. he's not a big gambler and cheating, lying and stealing are, you know, about some of the worst things that you can do character wise. You know, if you, yeah. if you have a buddy that steals something from a store or lies to his parents about something, you know, you, you just, it just kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth and you're just like, yeah, I don't know. So I, I guess, I guess just with, with those, you know, those morals growing up around my family and then obviously knowing the dangers of what, because most people just look at the positives. They don't, they don't think about that. And it's like, oh man, I, you know, I can run faster. I can throw harder. You know, I can recover quicker, whatever it is. Even now, like I just had, you know, Tommy John surgery and you could expedite the the plan, you know, and, and come back stronger. But you know, what I would be doing, I'm taking years off the back end of that. And you know, sometimes the person you become during that, it's not, it's not pretty. <laughs> you're, you're right. And, and the other thing is that you mentioned of, that's very powerful is a lot of people don't know where these drugs are coming from. And when we do programs for people, middle school, high schools, and even colleges, we show them pictures that we've gotten from the DEA, where these drugs are being made in these underground labs. And they kind of look at you like, wow, because they just envision that if they're buying some of these performance enhancing drugs, that they're coming out of a, a lab that's being made by a pharmaceutical company. And that's typically not the case and what a lot of us would have access to. So, you know, I'm really glad to hear you say that. But the other thing is, too, is you've had this great career and, and it's it's going to be amazing to look back on and say, man, through even all the ups and downs, I chose to do it the right way. And it's just so much rewarding that you did it without the use of, of drugs. And, you know, talking about your amazing career, I mean, you've been uh, in the big leagues for 10 years. You're a seven-time All-Star. You're a World Series champion, a two-time American League strikeout leader. So throughout your career, I mean, you've had to battle some injuries. uh, And even despite all these injuries, you've always come back and competed without the use of drugs. Did you ever feel the pressure at any time to use any of these banned substances or illegal drugs to, to try to come back quicker? Not not during my, my major league career, no. The the only time the thought popped in my head was in college, you know, before before it all starts, right? Yep. And, you know, that's when, you know, because when I got to the big leagues, I was around enough people to know that that was my, one of my favorite things that I learned in Chicago was actually from our strength coach, AT. Yep. And he, was, he wasn't really talking specifically about performance enhancing drugs, but it, it pertains to that. And he was talking about fueling your body. And he's like, you drive a car and you put, you know, you have a nice car. So you put the expensive gas in it and then you go eat Taco Bell or you go in or even, even farther than that. You put something in your body, like a steroid or like a growth yeah. hormone or something like that. He goes, you're treating your car better than you're treating your body. You put the best gas in your car and you're putting crap into your body. And he's like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so I, that that I was always that. something that kind of stuck with me when, when I, when I thought about those things, but like I said, even in college, when it was, you know, kind of a thought, you know, hey, you could, this, this is when you first get introduced to it. And you think about it, and then it's just like, you know what, at, at what cost? You know, at, at, what, at what point am I willing to trade potentially my life or, you know, the longevity or the quality of it to be, you know, who knows how much better you are on those things, you know? Yeah. And, then, and then the moral questions of, of the cheating – and all these other things it just 
it was it came across the table and it was a pretty quick no yeah. but yeah i mean i think every i think every athlete especially up to uh, at least college i think they they're faced with that you know at least once you're absolutely right. I mean, everybody at some point in their life, you know, especially if you are an athlete, are going to be faced with the pressures. And Chris, I mean, I'll be honest, you know, when, when Taylor was using the drugs, I was, you know, a Division One player. Uh, I knew many of the guys on my team that were actively using these drugs. And I'll never forget the conversation I had with Taylor. It was the last vacation we had right before he passed away. And I told him I was considering using him. And I'll never forget, he said, Don – don't use them. Don't get tied up with them. And I asked him why. And it wasn't for some of the, like, you know, the side effect reasons most people think about or commonly talked about, but he said, they make me aggressively depressed and I don't want you to feel that way. And I didn't understand what that meant at the time, but it's a conversation that's always stuck with me. So it's, it's so important to always share, especially coming from somebody like you to share this message so that they can understand at some point they're going to feel the pressure and you've got to make a decision at that point in your life of what you're going to do. As a role model that's taken this strong stance with us, you know, on, on, against these substances, what message would you share to, to a young person that's listening that might be considering using these drugs or they're feeling the pressure to use these drugs? I think it's pretty easy. I mean, I think it's, it's one of those things where you really have to sit down and do, do research. Like, at the end of the day, I can't make someone not do something or do something. The decision is, is on the individual person right but the only thing i would tell that person is do do your homework do research okay. and you can go online and you can and and you can find out for yourself because i i can sit here and tell them you can sit here and, and tell the stories show them the pictures and things like that but until they actually are educated i don't think that they're gonna fully know and that and that's where right. education is so big on this the information that you're fed that the things the truth, the, the real, the hard fact of performance enhancing drugs, because a lot of people only see the success stories of these, you know, You're right. major league baseball players, football players, things like that. And they're like, oh, well, look at this guy. He did it and he's fine. Yeah. Uh, he, he could actually still be playing to this day, you know, but sometimes it's, it's the back end of it, you know, down the road. It's not going to happen in five years. It's going to happen in 15 years. You're going to see it. And I just, I would, I would advocate for just the education behind it. Cause like I said, it, you, you gotta, it's your decision to make and no one can make it for you, but you need to be educated before you make that decision, you know? Yeah. And I'm so glad to hear you say that. And, you know, thanks to guys like you and major league baseball and, and all of our other supporters that we have. I mean, we are out there in these schools delivering this message to kids to make sure they understand that whatever decision it is you make in life, make sure that it is an educated decision. And, you know, it's, it's so important because you're right. You hear a lot of the success stories, but somebody sitting in my chair behind my desk and the phone calls that we get from parents who have, a young person that has either passed away as a result of using these types of drugs or substances or, you know, that, that have suffered depression or whatever other type of ailment they might have gotten. Uh, those are the types of stories to me that are so powerful that need to continue to be shared. Let's change yeah. gears just for a minute, Chris, because, you know, you've made it to the pinnacle of your sport. You're the ace of the Boston Red Sox. You're a World Series champion. And I'm sure the 2018 season was a season that you'll never forget. You're the opening day starter. You guys have an amazing season. You get to the World Series against the Los Angeles Dodgers. And you get a start in game one, which you guys beat the Dodgers 8-4 to four and end up winning the World Series in game five. What is the most memorable moment for you during that series? Whew. I mean, it's got to be the last pitch or, okay. or, or just the last game. That's the one – I mean, obviously, it's the one that stands out the most, just being able to be – I mean, I, it, I said it before in other interviews. I, I got to live out my dream. I literally – you know, I became a Major League Baseball player, got to the World Series, and I was able to throw the last pitch of the World Series. And, yeah. that I mean, even to this day, I, you know, I'll look back on it and, and see it and watch the clip. And it's just, it's crazy to, to watch it because I, I mean, I can put myself back there. It's like when I watch it, I can, I can like almost replicate that. And uh, no, it's, it was, it was an awesome feeling. It obviously, it, you know, the, the grind of the season, 
throughout the part parts of the year, you got different people pulling weight and working as a group, playing as a team. We had unbelievable leadership on that team from our coaching staff down to our players, even our front office. I mean, we, you know, they, they did everything they could to help us succeed. And, and we went out there and collectively as a group, we did it. And there's, there's just no better feeling, you know? And I think that's yeah. why you can learn so much from team sports. Cause you look back on that season and obviously Mookie was the MVP and JD was doing, you know, big things, but you know, look at, you know, Jackie in the ALCS or even Devers in that last game. You know, there, there are so many people that stepped up, you know, David Price going on short rest, pitching an unbelievable game in game three. Ivaldi, I mean, I can sit here and name names all day. And even in that first game, you look, yeah. that, you know, that was the game I started. I didn't have a great game. Eduardo Nunez puts us on the board first with a three-run shot. It's like there's so many different names, so many different people. And that's, you know, it, it, it's an awesome thing. It was fun to watch and fun to be a part of. And, and always to look back and say, because I remember watching that series, but to know that you did it, all you, you know, and that, that kind of brings us to the next conversation of all me. And that's where I want to bring this whole conversation for full circle and talk about all me. And for, for those that are listening for the first time, just a little bit of background on how our relationship began uh, was back in 2015. We here at the Taylor Hooten Foundation wanted to find a way to inspire young people to live and compete without the use of appearance and performance enhancing substances. And we've been working with Major League Baseball since 2005. And with the blessing of Major League Baseball, we began to reach out to all 30 teams, asking one player from each team to voluntarily step forward to be role models for young kids. And Chris, you were one of the first players who stepped forward. And I remember at the time uh, you were with the White Sox and have, have been helping us impact lives since then. And when you moved over with the Red Sox, you agreed to remain on the advisory board. Why is it so important for you to serve on our advisory board and take a stand against the use of appearance and performance enhancing substances? I've always kind of been a big advocate. And I have a, I've had a lot of teammates that are just as passionate about it but I just you know when, when I see someone do it like that it almost it almost just kind of puts a mark on their record for me you know I'll, I'll never not call this guy a cheater he can be a nice guy he can be a great teammate he can be a great ball player but I always know in the back of my mind that he's a cheater yeah and I would never want someone to think of me like that never in a million years would I want just a permanent black mark on my records or my you know your your record as as you know your character yeah. and who you are as an actual person I also believe that you know all joking aside I would be the perfect candidate for this because I'm 6'6 six, six, yeah. I'm 180 pounds like I'm one of the skinniest guys probably still in major league baseball <laughs> and you know for, for me it would be oh well let's go you know let's go pack on 20 pounds or 30 pounds real yeah. quick and and do this and I just I take pride in doing it the right way and you know just and another thing is you you I don't know it, I've been given something that I am not going to hold on to forever and I'm going to pass on to someone else. Yeah. And that's the game of baseball. And I love this game. I've played this game since before I can remember. And I want people to be able to not only see me while I was playing, but even after my career, I can tell people, hey, listen, I did this the right way. Yeah. And however the numbers shake out, whatever my career looks like at the end of it all, I'll, I will be proud of that because – no matter if it's good, bad, or indifferent, if I'm just an, another guy in line or whatever, I know that I did it the right way, and, and, I can, and I can pass that along to the next generation of baseball players. You're a true role model. You're a true leader. And, you know, you say you have a lot of other teammates that support this, and that's very true. I, I don't know if you know this story or not, but when I saw you, I guess it was three years ago in Florida at spring training, uh, we had a chance to visit with you and, and our other advisory board member from the Red Sox, Dustin Pedroia. And mm -hmm. I'll never forget, we met you first, and then Dustin came out, and I had a bag of shirts, these all me PD free shirts that we're handing out. Well, Dustin leaves, and we're kind of walking out to the parking lot, and he comes back. He said, hey, man, do you have any more of those shirts? Like, my teammates are all over me. They're like, hey, dude, can we get a shirt? And I was like, uh, absolutely. So we gave him the rest of the, the shirts that we have, which I know you guys wear proudly and super appreciate the support of that. Because, I mean, we get to see you guys wearing them all the time. 
The other thing is, Chris, you know, you've been so generous over the years of donating items that we give to kids in schools that follow your lead and take the pledge to live and compete without the use of appearance and performance enhancing substances. And there's items, uh, you know, jerseys and gloves and even cleats that you've signed and sent to us that we've used in auctions to help us raise money. And I just can't tell you the impact it makes on these kids' lives when they get to hold one of your items that's signed. Why is it important through your generosity to help support this mission? Like I said, I think it's just passing, passing the torch and doing – it's something that I believe in. I was even talking to my oldest son, he's 10, about this. And, you know, he's, he's, as bad, he's like, why would people do this? Like, why can't you just get rid of drugs? He, he said that right before I got on this phone call. He goes, why can't you just get rid of them? Yeah. And I said, well, that's what we're trying to do. You know, <laughs> this is something that has started because of a tragedy. Yeah. And we're trying to spread the word to athletes, not only in baseball, but in, in every sport and even in life, to not buy into this crap of doing drugs is going to make you better because in the end, it actually makes you worse. Yeah. And he, it was kind of a cool moment because kind of, I saw something click in him that he'll remember, hopefully forever. And to hear him even say, you know, why can't we just get rid of it? And, you know, for me to sit there and, and – tell him like hey you know this is something that i'm trying to do we're trying to do major league baseball is trying to do and uh you know hey if he's ever out there he can he can you know carry the carry the torch well that's awesome and it's it's almost the perfect way to end our call is is talking about you know all me and the all me shirt so we're getting ready we we just did a you know, an online deal where we've got people ordering shirts in fact we've had people that see you wear the all me shirts that I think I ran into a guy on a plane one time. He's like, oh, that's a Chris Sale All Me shirt. I was like, man, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll send you a I wish text. You had a bigger, uh, I wish you had a bigger billboard to put it on other than my scrawny body. But <laughs> <laughs> well, what so I'm, I'm going to do. I'm glad it's getting out. Yeah, no, I, and we appreciate it. It's cool. In fact, we had a team, I believe they were in Massachusetts somewhere, that ordered, like, shirts for every single one of their players on their team. So what I'll do when, when I get off this, I'll send you a text message or an email and we'll get you. We'll make sure your son gets one of the new shirts so he can wear it too. So I'll just need a. We'll, I'll, I'll get all the information on the backside so we can get him a shirt out. Yeah, for sure, no doubt. That'd be yeah. awesome. He would be, he would be so pumped because I, I mean, you know, I you can ask any of my teammates. Like, what's my wardrobe on a daily basis? <laughs> all me shirts, blue, you know, Red Sox shorts, and yeah. uh, you know my shoes. So I mean, it's something I wear every day because it's you know it's important. And like you said, I mean it's. If two people see it and it clicks with one person, that's one more person. And yep. you know, the more people that see these shirts and, and understand what it is and get educated on, you know, what's going on, the, the better off we're going to be. Well, I mean, to, to back that up, when I saw you in Texas, I guess it was two years ago or so, uh, the clubhouse manager, when I was sitting there visiting with him in the dugout before the game, and you were out warming up or, you know, doing your stretches or what have you, you had your all-me shirt on, and – he was telling me, he's like, dude, Chris wears these shirts all the time. The darn things are getting worn out. Like, and I think we, I was like, look, we need to send him some more shirts in because that, that's awesome that you wear them all the time. And this year we've got brand new shirts. You probably haven't had a chance to see them, but the, the message this year, there are no shortcuts to home plate, which is just so perfect. So we'll get you one out uh, really, really soon. But last thing, Chris, you know, for, for all of those youngsters out there who were tuned in, listening to this conversation, what is one thing you'd like to say to them about living and competing without the use of these drugs? I think that in the long run, you're going to, you're going to feel more satisfaction. You're going to, you're going to know at the end of the day that you tried and did everything and within your power. And I think that's the most important thing because I, I bet there's a lot of guys that, that did it the wrong way. And they're looking back on their career, asking a lot of questions, right? Like you get to the end of your career you can't go back and change it. You can't play more to change it. All you have is the memories that you made and the choices that you made. And when I get done with my career, I'm going to be able to sleep fine at night knowing that, hey, not only did I put all the work in that I possibly could, I left it all out there on the field, but I did it the right way. I have no questions about anything that I could have done when I'm done playing this game. Those people that cheated, I bet they sit around and, and a lot of them think, well, man, they, they have a lot of questions for themselves because they didn't do it by themselves. Right. And I think doing it, you know, doing it the right way, it, it leaves no doubt, leaves no question. 
it's who you were, it's what you did, and it's how you did it that gives you the peace of mind and the respect for yourself to be able to hold your chin high no matter how many, if you played a day in the big leagues, if you played 20 years in the big leagues, if you were the best player in the league or if you were the worst player in the league, you can be proud of what you accomplished. I can't agree more, and that is the whole genesis behind all me. Well, Chris, you know, I want to thank you for all of your leadership and support. Our mission simply isn't possible without the help of people like you, the Boston Red Sox, and Major League Baseball. And I know together we're not only impacting lives, but we're saving them too. So thank you for taking the time to join us on the All Me podcast. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening to the All Me podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, a nonprofit organization leading a national campaign to enlighten people to the truths about appearance and performance enhancing substances and inspiring people to live and compete without the use of these substances. Please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and tune in to our next episode.